Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April 2022 meeting of the Howard Astronomical League, better known as HAL. And I'm thrilled to have all of you here. Um, the meeting is being recorded, and um, you'll be able to view this on YouTube uh, at another time. Uh, if you want to go back and check the notes, uh, you know, check what was talked about, or if you know somebody who missed it, you can tell them how to get there. And we're going to actually cover that in some detail here in a few minutes. So I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, this meeting today is going to be really very, very interactive. Uh, so you know, feel free at any time to unmute yourself and jump right in. If you're not speaking, uh, please keep yourself on mute because it'll uh, help with any uh, loop back or any background noise that you may not know you have. So let's jump in here. So as always, we start our meeting with a little astro humor. I'll give everybody a second to take it in. <laughs> because everybody's muted uh, to anybody who might be watching this recording, that's why you can hear me laughing out loud. <laughs> If only we knew dark matter was actually a force. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the dark energy part, but we'll go there. So anyways, I'd like to uh, you know, not only welcome our, uh, our, our regular uh, members and participants, but our, any new members that we have and any guests. So do we have any new members here? If we do, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Any new members today? Yeah, I joined in um, December, I guess it was. I've been kind of lurking every once in a while, uh, but I also uh, am a member of uh, Central Maryland Photographers Guild, and they have a meeting on the same night that you do. So uh, I'm not going to be a regular, I'm afraid, but um, I'll, I'll come as soon as often as I can. Well, Stuart, well, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, the good news is if you miss uh, one of these meetings, you could you could watch the recorded version. And um, then you could ask any questions or make any comments to the group. Uh, in the email group, and uh, you'll get plenty of responses. You okay, have thank to you very long. Stephen, is that the group that meets in Robinson right next door to us? Uh, they used to before the pandemic, yep. Sure, yeah, okay. Yeah, there's another one of your group who's actually in that meeting today because he, he was interested in that topic, so he's going to be watching the recording. Yep, that's a, that's a wonderful service that you do with the recordings. That's great. Yeah, so so you say hi to Dave when you see him next time. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, any uh, so welcome, Dave Stugan. Do you have a telescope? Do you do any kind of observing, or are you a cosmologist, or what's your? I don't know. I'm I'm kind of aspirational still. Um, uh, I'm a good friend of Jim Tommy's, who's also in the group, and uh, yeah. so I watch what he does. I had a telescope when I was a kid, you know, growing up, and uh, six inch reflector, and and um, I always wanted to be able to uh, take pictures and I was never, you know, I didn't have much of a uh, capability for doing that. So I, I just um, thought, you know, once I retired, which I am now, I might, uh, you know, get some more equipment and, and uh, do some of that. At, at right now, what I'm, I'm aspiring to do is to take some night sky photos with, with just my DSLR and then I'll grow into some more sophisticated stuff later. Maybe we'll see. Very good. Well, you'd be amazed at what you could do with your DSLR. We have uh, some uh, people in this club who do amazing work. Yep. Not a telescope at all. So it starts with the imaging. So welcome. I would, like I said, thrilled to have you. Any other uh, new guests? All right. Well, uh, just, just a quick point for Stephen. Yep. The Kalamazoo Astronomy Club has their um, astrophotography session on YouTube now that you can see that talks you through the entire process. It's pretty good. The process of night photography, astrophotography. Oh. Okay, I'll check them out. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of research, so I, it's just a matter of you know getting myself in gear to go out on a you know clear night and a cold night and you know, get some photos. But uh, I have a lot of inspiration. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, new members? Hey, Phil. I'll go. I'm Lee Amos. I think I've just got my first name on the the, the display. Yep. I'm sorry, I don't have my camera running tonight. Um, but I'll work on that so you'll be able to see me <laughs> in person from here on out. Um, I joined the group last fall, um, and this is actually the first time I've even had a ghost of a chance of attending one of the meetings. I may not be able to stay the whole time, um, but I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to rebalance work-life balance. Work has just been crazy, especially with COVID the last two years. 
Um, I, I've been into astronomy since I was 10, believe it or not. Started out with a Sears telescope, or a uh, poor man's refractor. And uh, like Stephen, I had aspirations of marrying that up with photography, but I was not a film guy. That never worked out. So I went down the astronomy route for years. And then when digital photography arrived, I got deep into that. And then I started to marry the two interests together. And, um, you know, I have been posting some things online. Uh, you guys probably might have seen some of my work. I, I'm actually getting back into it. I hadn't taken a picture through the telescope uh, until August of last year for about 12 years. Um, you know, I have two kids that have finally entered college at this point. So I've been able to kind of get back into devoting stuff, time to, and energy to my personal interests and hobbies. And so that's kind of what's renewed my ability to start getting into this again. Um, always been passionate about it and uh, looking forward to diving deeper into this. I'm very interested in the filters discussion. I'm one of those DSLR guys. Uh, been using those the whole time, never did anything with a dedicated astro cam. Um, and I've gotten pretty decent results uh, through trial and error over the years. Uh, but I'm looking to, to go deeper down that path and, and looking towards a dedicated astro capability. Very good. Well, that's, that's a lot and that's great. And uh, welcome. I, I think, I, um, I know you've been active uh, in the emails and we've seen you there and you sent me some stuff. So um, we're thrilled to have you involved and we hope the skies cooperate for both you and Steven and everyone else to help, uh, you know, you know, give you something to take pictures of other than the clouds. <laughs> and um, so uh, any other uh, new members? Any guests? I know there's one guest. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Vidya. Um, Vidya. Vidya, yes, like Lydia with a V, Vidya. And um, I'm here with my partner, Tina. She and I have been interested in astronomy for a really long time, but we're complete newbies. Um, I don't even own a telescope, but Michelle is working on that. I'm a friend of Michelle and Eric's. Um, we do ballroom dancing together. And she told me about this club and I was extremely interested. And um, we've always just been interested in knowing what's out there. Um, we haven't even ventured into the field of photography or anything like that. We just want to know more about what's beyond our planet. So that's why we're here. And I'm a high school teacher. She's a police officer and I teach math and um, that's about it for now. Oh, that's great. So we're, we're thrilled that you made it today and we look forward to seeing you some of the events. And you know, one of the things I want to emphasize is that when we talk about the, uh, the photography and the images, that's something that we could share. You know, we could see that, but the club has, is we're much more than imaging. You know, we have, uh, we, we have people who do observing, we have people who have no optics at all, they're into the cosmology, they're into the science and the physics of it, and you know, the astrophysics and all kinds of other areas. We have people that uh, they, they count, um, you know, satellites that go over and-, and Oh, meet. wow. <laughs> and we, so we have people that have all kinds of interest in this club uh, and spectroscopy uh, is part of it too. And that's come some different technologies that go. So you don't have to be an imager or, or own a telescope um, you, you can look right up, you can use a binocular, you know, you know, or, you know, whatever you need to do, and there's different things. And you're going to hear about a lot of them as we discuss the filters today and okay. their applications. So, awesome. Yeah, I've spent my fair amount of time staring at the moon through binoculars. So I think I'm ready for an upgrade now. There you go. And there's a lot to see there once you know what you start looking for. And okay. uh, some, some great moon apps on that you can download to your uh, tablet or your phone, and it gives you some targets to look at instead of just looking at the moon you can look for things awesome so, thank you thank you yeah. so very good well welcome big hail welcome to the new members and the guests and um let's get uh, any other guests otherwise we'll get moving on okay so here we go click on the right screen all right so um we had a as far as i know it was the first time ever that we've actually canceled a public star party you know we say we're there rain or shine um, but this time, because the uh, state of uh, Maryland and Howard County followed suit to declare a weather emergency, it, it automatically closes the parks. 
So even though that uh, we have a key to get in and out of the park, you know, we can't open a park that's been officially closed for other than it's after hours. So um, that was a shame. Uh, and, uh, our, our, our weather streak is still strong, three years running, that uh, it, it negatively has impacted ourselves. And this Saturday, we have a, um, a members only start party. So for anybody that's new or hasn't been involved in these, that means it's for only members. It's not open to the public. You can't bring any guests outside of maybe an immediate family member, okay? Um, this is when the members have the opportunity to, to um, do their own work, their own research, their own imaging, their own enjoyment of what they're doing without having to share the telescope with uh, members of the public and also to help each other out, you know, when we, you know, to learn new things. And uh, so you, it doesn't mean you can't go and talk with others. In fact, we encourage it and enjoy and learn from others, but um, it's not open to the public. And uh, so it's just for members and it's at, eight, it's at Alpha Ridge, starts at sundown. It'll go until the hosts decide it's time to, that they want to go home and, and close up. But uh, the weather's looking a bit iffy. So we'll just have to see what happens. Um, and then here you have the list here of uh, the, the public and the member star parties. And uh, this has nothing to do with the impromptu star parties. Once again, um, the impromptu star parties are for members only. If you, know, you will not see an email if you're not, if you have not um, gone on the website and you know, signed in as a member and then uh, asked to be put on the impromptu list. And what that means is the weather is gonna be clear one night. One of the key holders uh, for the parks that we, um, the two parks, uh, Alpha Ridge and Carzmo Park, um, will say, hey, I'm gonna open up tonight. Either it's gonna be clear or I'm gonna plan on opening up tomorrow night. Um, and then, so those are the impromptu members only star parties. But the only way you can hear about them is you have to sign up for the impromptu mail list, which you can go do through the website after you sign it. Any questions? Okay. Um, once again, here's our, our leadership team and our, and our chair people. And once again, um, I'm kind of the face that you see most of the time, uh, but the majority of the work uh, comes from all of these people who really do just a, a wonderful job all the time. Uh, on all of your behalf. So um, we're not gonna go through and do a bunch of uh, different um, reports on what's happening uh, today. Um, unless somebody, unless one of the uh, officers or chair people have something they would like to pipe in with, please do. Hearing none. Next month, we have a, uh, uh, a presenter who's a fan favorite. Uh, I don't know how many of you were on when uh, Dr. Benjamin Schumacher spoke to us last time, but uh, we went uh, well into the night, well past our, our meeting time conclusion, as uh, so many of you had interest uh, in what he was talking about with the um, quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And this time he's got a very uh, interesting talk. He's going to talk to us about six impossible things and related to astronomy. Um, He's, uh, uh, he, what I put there on the bottom was a little bit of a plug for him. That if you have the great courses or Wondrium, uh, these are his uh, courses that he, he uh, teaches on, on, on that um, platform. And uh, the Stephen Hawking one, he's, uh, he's, uh, he has some comments in there. So he's the uh, inventor of the word qubit for quantum bit. And he's also the, uh, he's, he's also known in the physics world for creating the Schumacher equation. And uh, he will not be talking about that. So, <laughs> and thank God, because I don't want the test. So he's gonna be great. And he's our speaker next month. So make sure you, you call on in. All right. Um, so um, what I wanna do now is uh, move into uh, an area with social media. And I see Ken is on and, uh, and uh, Jared's here. Is Hannah on today? No, Hannah? Okay. So, um, so uh, Hal is really moving into the social media world. Uh, we've been there, but it just gets deeper and deeper and, and more involved. And you could access all of these um, 
locations right from our website. Uh, Ken Sal does just a wonderful job in keeping this current and trying to make it as easy as possible. So uh, we do have a Facebook page. I don't know if you, if you don't know, you can just, when you're at the um, howardastro.org, right at the top of the page, I put an arrow here, it's pointing to Facebook and you just click on that and it'll take you right to our Facebook page. And we also now also have a, um, a YouTube page. And um, Ken has put a, quite a bit of a work in there to get all of our past uh, recorded events and, and meetings uh, uploaded into YouTube and get it set up. And what I would like everybody to do is, uh, the way you get there is you just write the top of the page, just click on YouTube. When it comes up, you'll, you'll get a page that'll look something like this with a lot more white space around it. I just clipped it to kind of put that in there and you could click on uh, 2022 and you could see the January presentation, the February presentation, and then this one will be uploaded in a, in a few days. Um, and when you get in, I'm asking uh, everybody to subscribe because we have to, we're, we're brand new at this and we have to have uh, 100 subscribers to have an official YouTube channel. And you can see right now we're up to 62 subscribers. So if you go in, there's no cost. Just click on subscribe, get your family members to click on subscribe and we'll go right over that. Ken, anything you'd like to add? Uh, just uh, emphasizing that the 100 subscribers uh, is so that we can get our own URL. We can pick our own URL. And so it'll have like Howard Astro in it instead of the weird alphanumeric thing that there, that it is right now. And that'll, you know, that'll give us, you know, more recognition. And um, the playlist that you see down there that Phil was talking about, um, you know, are organized differently. Uh, the one on the left is all historical videos uh, that, that uh, predate, uh, actually go back to 2000. Five, I believe, and um, the 2021 is all the videos that we took last year through the pandemic, and then we're starting the one for 2022 here. But you can also think, see things in a different way by clicking on the videos link up above instead of playlists, then you can see all what we have is 17 videos right now. And uh, that's it. Very good. So this is great. Um, it'll be much easier for everybody to access the recordings and we don't have to manage uh, all kinds of uh, disk management server situations that we would if we were running this ourselves and, uh, and other people anywhere in the world could, could get in and see this. So, Oh, uh, well, I'm sorry. One more thing, Phil. Yep. Yep. Um, if you're hesitant about subscribing, thinking you're going to get a whole lot of emails as a result of that, that's not what subscribing is for YouTube. So, you know, don't hesitate to subscribe. All it'll do is, you know, add it to the list of other things that you might want to subscribe to uh, that you might see in the, on the left side when you come into YouTube. But it doesn't really cause additional emails to come to you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. Thank you. Um, Hannah's not on. But we also have an Instagram page. Once again, you could click on it right from the homepage on the website. And um, there's a uh, link in our website too, if you want to um, uh, add one of your pictures. You know, we want to keep this all astronomy um, focused, a little pun intended. Um, you know, it's not a place for family pictures and things like that. And there's, a, there's an application form, which is pretty simple. You wait for you attach your image, you give some descriptive information about it. And then it goes to Hannah and she makes sure it, it uh, passes up. We don't make judgments on the quality of the picture. We just wanna make sure that it follows within the, the guidelines. And then she posts them up there. And uh, right now we have 234 followers, but uh, one of those followers is the Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum. So we get their um, 300,000 followers that indirectly tag into us right through there too. So, uh, you know, Hannah's managing this and uh, she's doing a really good job at it and we very much appreciate it. So the next thing we've got going on, we're gonna spend some time on it, 
Um, you, you've seen some traffic on email about it. Now we're going to really officially launch it tonight, which is Discord. And this is uh, discord.com and it's for members only. And Jared is a, uh, Jared Case is uh, leading this effort for us and he's the, the person with all the answers and some descriptions going on. So Jared, I've got your slides and I'll, be, you guys, you, I'll, I'll move them and you walk me through. Uh, that sounds good, Phil, thanks. Yeah. And I promised it wouldn't be more than 10 minutes. So I'll try and keep it to the point and uh, straightforward. So um, happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way. Yeah. Um, so what is Discord? Why do we want to hear about it? Why should you get involved in it? And then finally, you know, how do you join if you're interested? So I've just got a few slides. I promise I won't kill you with a bunch of PowerPoint presentation slides today, but I do have a couple of things I want to share with the, with the group. So Phil did a good job of going through some of the social media platforms. We talked about the Google Forms and the email communication. And I want to be clear, Discord is not replacing any of those, right? It is not meant to... Uh, become the only communication that you're gonna have with Hal. It's just an enhancement, if you will, or another platform that provides a little bit more communication, a little bit more real-time communication, if you will, uh, for all things uh, astronomy related or Hal related. So please continue to use email as you normally would, and those communications will continue to move forward as they are today. So if you know anything about Discord, it, what it isn't, right? It, it is not also just for gamers. I know if you do a quick Google search, the first thing that comes up is Discord was founded by gamers um, to provide a platform to communicate while you're playing video games. Certainly that's the origin, but um, not necessarily what we're using it for at all uh, within HAL. So Discord on their website has a, a nice quote um, that I put up in the top right corner in, in black there that describes what it is, but what it is for us, essentially, I'm going to try and boil it down. It's essentially chat rooms, right? For those of you that have used chat rooms before, it's dedicated chat rooms for specific topics that we like to talk about. So you'll see if you get into Discord, and I have a couple slides that'll show some of the channels that we're talking about but it provides a forum for us to communicate on specific threads, specific interests, um, and share not just text, but pictures, links, things of that nature that are relevant to that particular channel. Uh, we started this actually back in October uh, with the winter imaging activity, kind of a small subgroup of us that volunteered to be part of that project. Um, we used it to share photos, to share, um, uh, processes to, to, to talk about how we're going to go through that activity. And it, it turned out to be a really helpful platform for that. But so why would you go to Discord? <clears throat> I gave some use cases and examples that you can read through. I'll give you a couple high level points. Um, I've been involved in some conversations in the past. And obviously, my background is largely in astrophotography. That's what I tend to lean towards. Um, I like visual as well. But I'm an astrophotography enthusiast, and um, some people brought up the idea of doing a processing challenge, which is to say, let's share some data and everybody use the same data and use different techniques to process that data. Um, so we put that together in the Discord. It's a fun way of basically improving your skills and communicating and, uh, and trying out some new tools. Um, we also have an object of the month. So uh, every month we pick a different target to focus on. Um, take pictures of that target and then we upload the pictures as a group and we see all the different you know interpretations and, and ways that people like to capture and focus on different objects and share that with the group and Hannah was very nice to volunteer to also take those pictures and put it into a carousel on Instagram at the end of the month. Um, in addition it's not just for astrophotography um, we had I think it was at Don Miller Phil that presented I don't want to mess up the name um, but he was the artist right that we had on a couple of month, a month ago. Um, so I started a, a space art channel and this has picked up a lot of interest from sketches. People might like to just do oils, whatever you do to paint your medium or, or display your um, artistic creativity that may not be just imaging. We have a channel for that. Uh, and then of course, you know, there's, there's help, right? So there's a lot of questions that people might have just from a, how do I find targets? What kind of filters should I use to, how do I use discord? Um, and we have additional channels we see up in the top left corner. Some help is a channel. 
We also have a channel for selling equipment. Maybe you have something you want to list. There are other ways to do that. Um, but for this community, that's one. And I also want to say too, right, it's important to note that this isn't a social media platform from the perspective of things we do in the server are just for how community members, it's not going to be seen by the public. It doesn't, we don't have advertisers coming in and, and looking at a, a news feed or anything along those lines. It's really a private chat room area just for the folks that we allow into the server. You can go ahead, Phil, I'm done with this slide. So if you're interested, you want to learn more about it, the best way to do it is jump in. Uh, what you need, of course, is a digital device. Um, you can choose your phone or a computer. Uh, there is a phone app for Android and iPhone. And if you're using a PC or a Mac, there is an app that you can also download for your computer. If you're anti-software download, you can use your web browser. Uh, that works as well. Um, Ken has been kind enough to uh, post uh, a link here that, that I can provide. Uh, that's provided that allows members to log into the howardastro.org forward slash discord, which will take you to a link that will allow you to get into the discord server via the medium that you choose. So if you're using the app, it'll open up in the app and you'll be in the HAL server. Once you get in, please read through the discord rules. Um, these are standard kind of um, best practices as far as making sure the content you're posting is appropriate, right, for the HAL community. Um, but please read through that. You do agree as you join the Discord server to comply with those rules. Um, and then finally, you know, and ask any questions that you might have in the Some Help Room. And uh, once you get in there, everybody's very helpful. We've got a, a tremendous community inside the HAL Discord group with a lot of background and a lot of talent. And so I'm sure we'll be able to answer your questions or get you pointed in the right direction. And um, that's all I have. So, so, Jared, I would like to add one piece onto this as far as uh, to emphasize this is members only so what you're going to you're not going to see what you have with Facebook with and and Instagram and YouTube you're not going to see a hot link button or icon at the top of our web page so you have to be signed in to the HAL website as a member in order to get to the link and can um, um, so um, could you describe once you're signed as a member where you would step through, you know, which uh, tag you would go into to get to the Discord? Well, well, right now it's the link that he has up there on number two there. Yep. You know, it's just howardastro.org slash Discord, right? right? Yep. So <clears throat> there is no tag to it. Okay. Now, although, you know, we, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we could certainly put an icon up there. There's yeah. unless, you know, so depends what you guys want to do but right now so we're working on some of those details you know we you know the the um it is it is really a, a, a security thing if you will for hal i mean this is a a closed group um for deep conversations on whatever the topic that's hal related as jared said a couple of times and um so but if you go to this and I, for me personally um i'm just using the web browser and it works great and once you're signed in, once you click, it, even if you just go to discord.com, it'll take you right to this. Once you're, you know, you don't have to go in after you start there with howardastro.org slash discord. And then when you just sign into discord, it'll take you to it. It's from the same device. If you change devices, you might have to do it again, but otherwise, yeah. So it works great and it's being used very heavily by, uh, so it's any questions on that? It's kind of a big deal, a very positive big deal. And so I want to thank Jared uh, for you know everything he's done with this and handling all the emails and the conversation from the leadership team as we rolled this out. Nothing happens by magic. So thanks. So if there are any questions, look forward to seeing you in the Discord and uh, feel free to ask away and we'll we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Yeah. Oh, there was your last slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, does anybody have anything they want to uh, cover real quick before we get into the filter conversation? Yeah, this is Wayne. I just wanted to uh, make sure Mark Hickman had his hand raised earlier and I don't know if he ever got to say anything. So hopefully I'm not putting him on the spot right now. Hey, Mark. You can have to unmute Mark so we could hear you. If you have a question or something I missed. 
for help. Wayne, I appreciate you keeping track. If anybody sees something that comes up in the chat that we need to address, um, please pop it up because I can't man, I can't watch all the things. So if you see somebody's hand up, just stop and we'll get going. Uh, we'll stop and we'll cover it. I mean, so filters are not just for astronomy, uh, not just for um, for imaging, I should say, astro imaging. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons to use filters and there's all different ways to do it. And this is a very interactive conversation. So I've changed the format for this meeting um, from what we normally do. Usually what we do is we take any of the uh, astro images that were sent in and we hold those and we cover those after all the presentations are done and people talk about their pictures. And what I've done now is I've actually incorporated the pictures that were submitted and I actually hijacked a few from some earlier meetings um, to make them part of the conversation. And um, to help me uh, lead this conversation, uh, Dale Gent uh, is, is, uh, is our former observatory director and, and board member and still very active and he's gonna help lead the conversation. And um, we didn't rehearse, so uh, he's gonna see what's going on and how it's laid out as we get going. Jared is also a volunteer, but anybody who's got um, anything that you want to add or ask as we go through, I do have some general questions where you know, you'll, it'll be pretty straightforward. The way that I organized it, not for any particular reason, is I've, I've kind of broken it down into um, uh, planetary, solar, and then deep sky, because the deep sky is going to have the, the greatest variety potential of ways to do things and that'll go on take us to the end of the to the end of our meeting time which is the reason that I chose that format um, and then I want to thank uh, Jim Tomney uh, Jim sent me um, some he did some research on filters from uh, cloudy nights and other sources and he sent me the slides and I actually broke those up a little bit and incorporated them in to the presentation and uh, so that'll help guide the presentation so thank you very much Jim and um, so let's get let's get started. Oh, and one thing you know I want to say here too is in, in this is if um, if you should be a subscriber to Astronomy Technology Today, uh, this is not the reflector that uh, we get from the Astronomical League as members. Um, we we automatically get those sent to us or get them online, however you uh, selected to do that. But Astronomy Technology is a magazine that I subscribe to. And it just so happened that the uh, this uh, quarter's uh, issue talks about filters. So there's, there's some really good information in there. But filters are not just related to uh, our, our observing and our own telescopes, that the James Webb Space Telescope uses filters. And um, so here's the the image that came out yesterday actually it came from Wednesday's uh, briefing, I believe. Uh, so it's just a couple of days old to the public. And um, I'm going to ask Wayne to jump in. Wayne, um, if you saw our email chats going on, he gave a wonderful description in, in response to a question. And I actually um, copied and pasted his answer, his, his uh, description into this. But he could talk a little bit about what we're looking at and how the filters are used. So Wayne? It's all yours. So first of all, I think we should probably take one step back and say, and uh, address what do we mean when we say the word filter? And in astronomy, you can think of a filter as some device that selectively samples some aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Normally we think of color filters, the RGB filters in our cameras, and narrow band filters. And those are selectively sampling the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum on the basis of wavelength. Okay, your uh, H-alpha filter for your sun solar telescope or your calcium uh, K-line filter is also a wavelength based filter. You can also have a filter that selectively samples polarization. Okay, your polarizing sunglasses only let certain polarization of light through to your eye so you can see uh, better without less glare. We also use polarizing filters in telescopes to measure properties primarily of the interstellar medium. 
and the other kind of uh, filter we tend to use in astronomy is what we call a neutral density filter, which selectively samples in some sense the intensity of the light. Okay, so that it uh, will reduce the amount of light you're receiving from the object. So a, a moon filter that lowers the brightness of the moon so it doesn't, so you can see better, or the solar filter that lowers the brightness of the sun so you don't go blind are examples of neutral density filters. Okay, so that's basically what we're talking about is some uh, device that selectively samples the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum in some way. And so the question got asked based on the uh, release from JWST on yesterday, whether or not JWST had narrowband filters and if they would be, if they were tuned for observing the distant universe. And so the answer is yes, JWST and Hubble Space Telescope and just about any other not just about every other professional telescope you ever run across will have filters that they use because the filters allow them to sample the electromagnetic, the spectrum of the object in a way that gives us scientifically valid information. So if you want to read what Phil copied and pasted, uh, some of the filters NIRCAM has in it is one at 1.64 microns, which is a forbidden a uh, line of iron, uh, singly ionized iron. So that's probably, if I'm, I'm not absolutely certain, but it's probably looking at chromospheric emission from stars. Okay, so that, so observations in that filter would tell us something about the chromosphere of the star. Uh, it also has one at 1.87 microns, which is from hydrogen, and it's the Poshin alpha line. It's kind of analogous, or it is exactly analogous to the hydrogen alpha line in the, uh, just at, from the N equal three level instead of the N equals two level, okay? And it also has one at 4.66 microns, which is a, a carbon monoxide molecular band, which is useful for being uh, observations of cool stars, which, you know, as an infrared telescope, that's not an unusual thing, okay? The point that from the question that was asked is, is that these wavelengths are set for the rest wavelengths of the uh, species of the emission or absorption line. So they are not, definitely not for distant universe use generally because the, the emission line or absorption line, if it's one of those, is gonna be red shifted outside the band pass of the filter, okay? And so these are also narrow band filters, just like our usual H alpha filters. So you don't really want to look at really, really, really faint things through narrow band filters because you're filtering out almost all the light you're getting from that really, really faint thing and you're not going to see it. So as a general rule, they wouldn't be used for distant uh, galaxies. Okay. And I'm not sure what else you might have expected me to say here, but. <laughs> That's all right, no, it's great. Uh, any questions for Wayne? And uh, Mike, uh, you asked earlier about uh, diffraction spikes and you could see very clearly, those are diffraction spikes that, uh, that Wayne was uh, talking about before the meeting got started that I had brought up and he was describing. Yeah, this is actually a, a 35 minute exposure of an 11th magnitude star with JWST. So six and a half meters of aperture. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, Wayne. That was awesome. So getting into uh, um, the filters, there's all kinds of different filters. Um, and uh, Dale? I'm gonna ask you to, to help out here and uh, you, you, the, the slides will be self-explanatory. But you know, Dale, one of the things as you talk about this, could you um, describe uh, you know, you know, where do you put the filter? Where, where does it go on the device that you're using? You know, we, so you know, for everybody, you know, we have brand new people that are beginners and we have everybody through to very, very experienced people. And this presentation here is designed to have a discussion from one edge to the other. So Dale? Yeah, hey everyone. Um, so depending on what your 
uh, you're doing in terms of is it visual observation or imaging? There's a there's many ways that filters can be fitted to your. Um, we just call it, you know, generically your optical tray. Um, whether there's a camera on the end of it or if there's an eyepiece on the end of it, it's just collectively referred to as the optical train. And um, and believe it or not, there are some standards here, but they vary um, uh, uh, depending on, and, and which standard applies uh, varies on, you know, what your application is. Um, and uh, starting out in the visual realm, you'll commonly see what's pictured here in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, or we call an inch and a quarter um, uh, filter sizes. And the budget is the 2022, and that has... Oh. I think I think I'll, yeah there you go oh thank you and uh, and so um, but there's also in the visual realm uh, commonly used uh, are two inch filters as well so you have inch and a quarter diameter threaded and and threaded filters with the with the metal or plastic we call it a, a cell around the actual glass we call those mounted filters uh, because there are unmounted filters literally just little circles or squares of glass. Um, so uh, uh, these, uh, in the visual realm, you, you generally have inch and a quarter or two inch filters. And which one you use um, depends on the size of eyepiece that you're using. You can use a two inch filter for everything, even if you have just a one and a quarter inch eyepiece. Um, but two inch filters being a larger amount of glass are more expensive than inch and a quarter. So if you only have inch and a quarter eyepieces, there's no need for you to run out and spend money on a two inch filter. You can you generally find the same filter in both varieties. And eyepieces um, are uh, also threaded for these filters. So these mounted filters with in, in using again, the, the filters up here in the upper right hand corner, they're threaded uh, you know, at a certain thread pitch uh, and, and uh -huh. thread per, per inch. Um, uh, the uh, the eyepieces or your Barlow are are uh, made to accept those threads. So you you would you would screw them on uh, directly to the bottom of your uh, of your um, eyepiece. This is a this is a this is a sun. This is one for uh, looking at the sun. But um, if you can see there, that black part on the end, that's just an inch and a quarter uh, filter screwed on to the end. If you can pretend this is just a regular eyepiece. So um, uh, you, for, for visual observing with Barlow's and eyepieces, you generally do not need a special adapter or anything like that. Um, they'll even, uh, you'll often even find the, uh, that your, di uh, your diagonal, if you have a, a diagonal um, uh, mirror or prism, uh, the telescope facing side of that prism um, is also threaded for. Uh, accepting filters, so um, two inch or inch and a quarter usually. Yep. So um, that's it on the on the on the on the uh, on the visual observing side, and on the uh, on the imaging side, we have um, filter cartridges. There's filters that fil that you can screw directly onto the front of the camera. Uh, filter cartridges where you can uh, slide in a filter, uh, take the cartridge out, and replace it with a, a cartridge that has a different filter. Uh, suspended in it in front of the camera, uh, and, in, and including filter wheels, mechanical wheels, either motor or hand driven, uh, that rotate a carousel of filters in front of the camera. Um, and, uh, and so you'll find those on more advanced uh, imaging setups. Um, and of course, the, the motorized filter wheels are computer controlled. So uh, those are, those are you know, generally the, the ways. Uh, and, and, and uh, that you find filters mounted uh, on your system, and uh, so um, and and so there's small and large sizes on the visual side, and it's mainly a cost and uh, consideration of which one you use compared to the uh, you know the eyepieces that you're using. And there'll be uh, opportunities to get into some of these specifics, especially yep. as we get into the pictures and everything. Sure. So that's yep. a great introduction. And uh, thank you very much. And you know, so what we're looking at here um, is, um, you know, this, like I said, the first part of this will be planetary. Um, 
filters for planetary use and talking about neutral density, Dale mentioned uh, neutral density filters. Um, and you can see here on the bottom, what without a filter, what the image looks like, and then the extra detail that's brought out when you're using a neutral density filter. And particularly with the moon, it's just very bright. That's reflected light. And uh, the, you know, the uh, closer it was to a full moon, either in a waxing or a gibbous uh, mode, uh, it'll determine the amount of brightness. Um, you know, when you get on the Terminator line, uh, you have a nice shadow and you can see all kinds of detail that you may not have seen before. But you could actually, even during a full moon, use neutral density filters and knock down the brightness and bring out the detail. And uh, I've done that quite a bit. Um, also, if you just have uh, polarizing filters and you put two polarizing filters getting you adjust them, it'll adjust the amount of light that comes through and you, you get a lot more detail. So can I any, go ahead, any questions? Yeah, I wanted to jump in real quick because uh, Dale talked about a bunch of filters that you can screw into the eyepiece yeah. and they're great. The colored filters for observing the moon and the planet, and they're great. There's also the neutral density filters, but there's also solar filters, which you definitely do not want to screw into your eyepiece. Okay, if you ever get a telescope and they sell you a solar filter for screwing in your eyepiece, the best thing you can do is take a hammer to it and break it because they're dangerous. You want for a solar filter, you def, you want to use one that goes over the total, the full aperture of the telescope before the objective lens or mirror, so that it cuts the light down before it even gets into the telescope. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in some detail coming up here. Right oh, after, okay, right sorry. After. No, no, it's all right. It's a good lead, and and it's never you can never talk about being safe with observing the sun too often. So. And you, you asked us all to just jump in. So. No, 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 it's fine, it's perfect. No, 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 I didn't send this out in advance. So, but, you, but he's right though. I would not have thought about saying that, you know, if, if you're buying a, a telescope from someplace and it comes with a, a filter, they say you can put it in an eyepiece. One is completely ir irresponsible. I mean, for what the type that Wayne's talking about. There are filters that are built to go on the back ends, but you know, then there's other things you need to do potentially too, depending on the size of it. So um, I'm not gonna read through all of this. You guys could see this and, and um, read it yourself, but you know, this kind of takes into effect of you know, the introduction that Wayne gave and, and, and Dale talked about is to, and it gives some examples of the planets on um, how you bring out different colors and detail. So um, I've got a couple examples coming up, but if there's anybody here on here um, who's doing your know, planetary uh, observing and imaging and or imaging, and you want to talk about your, your, your favorite filters and why you use that particular filter, please jump on in. Can I add a comment about moon filter? Yes. Uh, having done it, uh, if you don't put a, a neutral density filter in, it hurts your eyes to look at a full moon. It's just uncomfortable. So it's uh, a whole lot more comfortable to use a filter, not just to bring out uh, detail. Yeah. So the, um, but the, um, the point there too is to, to what Bill's talking about is it's the brightness. It's kind of like staring at a very bright light bulb. The, the moon from the, the light from the moon will not hurt you though where the light from the sun will. The moon is reflected light. It's not being, it's not generating light from, um, you know, from, from uh, you know, radioactivity and all this other stuff that's going on. Um, that's gonna, yeah, it's gonna damage your eyes, but it is very, very bright. So the more you can knock it down for visual observing, the better. And then you also wanna knock it down for uh, any imaging because it's, it's sometimes hard for your camera to stop down enough to, uh, to get the details. So you need to knock down the brightness to bring out the detail. Did you see if there's one can of soda left in there? Say that again? Can of soda left. Did you see if there's a can of soda left in the refrigerator? Oh. <laughs> uh, no, there isn't, Cheryl. In the door? <laughs> I knew I forgot something today. It's in the mail, you guys. It's all coming your way. So, um, 
here's um now th this presentation um i'll get it over to ken and in a couple of days um it'll be posted on our website you just go in you know to the website and go to the um the presentation area and you could pull up this information you, you pull up the, pre the entire presentation it doesn't have to be the recorded one from youtube you could actually see the uh, slides and uh, this information is in there and um it's also online you know jim pulled this down from cloudy nights and sent it over to me and you could see um what these different um eyepieces you, you know what the numbers mean what the colors are associated with them and how you would use them now for planetary it's very interesting especially when you look at planets like jupiter and saturn um, and you change the colors you see features that jump out at you that you didn't see and then you know you didn't see with uh, straight through or let's just call it you know regular white light if you will um and and uh it's it's you could spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time on a, on a planet, just changing the colors and seeing the observations, um, the different the things that you could view. Yeah. Somebody have a question? Okay. Okay. So, um, and, and, you know, when Dale was talking about, you know, where to, you know, how to fasten the, uh, the filter on the eyepiece or on, you know, or you could do it on the diagonal. The nice thing about doing the eyepiece on the diagonal, you know, this one happens to be two inches. So you either, you have to have a um, two inch filter to screw in there or have a reducer in there. But um, the nice thing is you could change eyepieces in and out for different magnifications without having to change, move the filter from one eyepiece to another. Every time you change music, you know, it'll be there on the diagonal itself. Um, if you have uh, an inch and a quarter diagonal and you're using an inch and a quarter eyepieces as a perfect scenario or vice versa with two inch and two inch, but there's ways to get it done. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so just a comment. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Thank go ahead, you. Mike. Um, how about the uh, uh, light pollution filters you I read about a lot? Are they because I noticed they're not on this list. And I'm, this may not be an all-inclusive No, list. this is just the planetary list, but there's lots of other filters, right? Somebody want to comment on the light pollution filter? I can, uh, I can, uh, over here. I can talk about that. Uh, so light pollution filters, you see them, there, there, there's, there's there, what, the, what light pollution filters are, are designed to do is block out a very, very, very narrow sliver of the visual spectrum of light. Um, and the, um, the, the, these, these little slivers of, 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 of spectra that they block out coincide with the wavelengths that are generated by um, um, uh, streetlights, mainly. Uh, specifically, high pressure sodium, which is kind of that orangey glow, you know, that traditional like city orange glow that you see from a distance. Uh, that's produced by high pressure sodium. There's also the uh, um, the uh, uh, the mercury lamps, mercury vapor lamps, and and those are a more a the brighter, almost stark, you know, cool, very cool, stark white um, street lamps that you may find, um, and and so those those are in the the bluer spectrum. So these these filters are designed to slice out those those specific spectra. Um, and then let everything else through. The, the problem obviously is you might infer is, is that if you're, the object you're looking at is also giving off light in those same wavelengths, that's also getting cut out. So it's not just light pollution that it cuts out, it's also any of that, uh, any of the same emissions from the object you're looking at. Um, Complicating that though is to switch to um, LED lighting for municipal lighting, um, and LED lighting, which is uh, is is broadband light. It's not narrow band light like the high pressure sodium and mercury vapor lights that we're used to since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so the, that so the 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 um, the performance of your traditional light pollution filter. Um, is 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 um, compromised by, you know, 
broadband LED lighting. Now it depends because LED lighting has, has matured over the past 10 years to be from broadband to a flavor of bands to a specific van, van as, as more people have become aware of the light pollution um, capabilities of LED lights. But that's another topic we can go into. Uh, so uh, these days, I would say that light pollution filters are, are, are not as useful as they used to be. And it really depends on your, your, your locality, if they've converted to LED lights or not, and which LED lights they've converted to. Um, so um, they're, they're, not a, they're not a silver bullet like they used to be. Okay, thank you. So in the, along those lines, though, uh, hey, Jim, did you have something you wanted to throw in? Yeah, I just wanted to mention a little bit about this particular article. Um, basically, this was uh, a guy who uh, did some in the field testing with filters, and uh, he was using a uh, Takahashi there, and um, he basically got some results. The way that he was doing his study was he was waiting for, for a good night with decent seeing, and he would pick a particular object, be it the moon or Mars or Jupiter, and he would kind of, he had all of these filters that you're seeing here, and he would just kind of pass them in front of his eye and inspect the image of the planet and then take it away and, you know, try to do like a, a ranking system in terms of which ones he felt were the best. And he repeated that on multiple nights. So this is kind of like a, a distillation of a lot of his effort here. And I would certainly encourage anybody to go uh, online and read the article or uh, if you subscribe to any of the Alpo podcast, he was on that, uh, I think about a year ago, uh, talking about how he did this project. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of places you'll go to like um, High Point Scientific or Orion, and they will have a specific set of color filters. Oh, you want to look at Mars, use this and this. And his results were different. He uh, actually came out with some uh, very different outcomes. Uh, compared to what you might uh, see from the people who are selling the filters. So at any rate, I think that I, I highly recommend the article if you're interested in visual observing of the planets. Uh, it's got some uh, great information in there. And, um, you know, definitely uh, suggest that you take a look at it. Thank you, Jim. And, you know, there's always the question of cost, and I'm just going to make a general statement here, and we can get into very specific filters, especially when we get into some of the uh, the deep sky object conversations. But uh, filters cost like these color filters, you could buy them in a kit uh, with all kinds of different colors like this for um, maybe even just under uh, like $150 or something. But then there's other uh, filters that you're gonna spend hundreds of dollars for, just for a single type of filter. So, you know, when you're choosing your filters, um, it's a very good idea to know what you want to observe and so you're buying the proper filter or filters to um, give you the best results and the most enjoyment, or if you're doing it, you know, even for science type stuff, um, to, to make sure that you got a good match. And there's people in the club that can help you. Um, if you go over to Company 7 in Laurel, where they sell the filters over there locally, um, you know, they know, you know, the questions, the answers to all those questions. So, um, Victor, hey, Phil. Ask, yeah, go right ahead. Hey. Phil, uh, the, the answer to the light pollution question is like one of those things that like a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. Um, do you have, I don't know what's in the rest of your presentation. Do you have any plots of the filter uh, uh, graphs versus frequency and the light pollution stuff? I do not, but if you have one and you want to share it, we could pop it up at any time. Yeah. Can I do that? I'm on my phone, so hopefully it'll work, but let me, let me just share a screen for one second. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and then you got it. Should we be okay. playing Jeopardy music? Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how to do this on my phone. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Okay. Um, well, wait a minute. Well, give me just one more second. Sorry. Okay. You have an issue. Um, well, never mind. If I figure out how to do this, I'll. All right, I'll we'll come you. back to you. Sorry. No. If not, Victor, uh, maybe you could um, share that in an email follow-up from the meeting. 
that that uh, that information that slide. Is okay. there a site? Is there a site I can go to, Victor, and try to grab it myself? Give it yeah, I think I just did it. So I'll let me see if that. I'll actually let me see if I can actually do this. It's okay. one more time. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. So this is a plot. This is from the uh, HUTEC IDAS light pollution filter page. And the, the website is like, you know, uh, I'll, put, I'll, I'll, I'll paste a link to the, to the website. But this shows what you're, what you're seeing here is on the horizontal axis. The, Victor, you're breaking up. The blue curve. Yeah, sorry. The, the blue curve on this plot is the light that is produced by a typical white LED. And the black curve is showing the band passes that this particular filter called an IDAS LPS2. So it's showing where it allows light to transfer through those, those plot, the, the, the peaks are where light comes through. The valleys are where it's blocking light. So it, it, this, does, this filter has been designed to block um, the wavelengths where that white LED is. And this, uh, you can actually click on this other thing. So the high pressure sodium that Dale was talking about there is this yellow light. And um, so you can see that in uh, it, this particular filter, it, it doesn't filter out all of it, but it, they tried to design this filter with, with band stops, not uh, blocks where it doesn't allow the light in the, the wavelengths around 550, 600 nanometers. Um, it, le it lets some light from these high pressure sodiums in. There's a narrow thing right around 500. Um, and then there's low pressure sodium, which is just a really sharp spike here. Um, and that is in the, in the band stop. And then they, they, um, uh, they weren't able to. So these guys have a few flavors of have this LPS D2, LPS D1 that have different. So like there's there's LPS D1. It's got it's got some of your audio is breaking up, Victor. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in a, in a bad spot. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll wrap it up saying that basically what these light pollution filters do is they try to put a block in the wavelengths that are emitted. It's basically what Dale said, but, but you can see it graphically here with one of these pictures, it's kind of easier to, to get it. Um, so that's and, all. And, and on this type of graph, uh, for those not familiar with, with these types of graphs, um, Blue light would be on the left side there, the shorter wavelength, and it would it then progresses across the spectrum to red uh, on the on the right on the right side of the graph. Um, after you get past about 700 uh, uh, nanometers in wavelength and on up, you're into what's referred to as like you're you're approaching the the, the near infrared um, uh, spectrum and. That's why you see the big drop off there and nothing after it as the wavelength gets longer because human eyes uh, are unfortunately not too good at seeing in the near infrared wavelengths. So, um, but that, that's, that's kind of like how you, how you read the graph there. So um, yellow uh, and green would be kind of situated there kind of um, towards, the, towards the center center left and then orange and red to the center right. Yeah, and, and Victor went through it really fast, but when he did the low pressure sodium, you saw it was just basically one spike there, just blue, just blue of 600 nanometers. And this is why the professional astronomers would prefer if communities use low pressure sodium all the time and exclusively because it's easy to filter out compared to all the rest of the uh, options on the lights. 
unfortunately, low pressure sodium gives really poor color rendition to things you're looking at. So but aesthetically, they're not very pleasing. Yeah, all of this particular company's filters, all of their filters have a have a block right there at low pressure sodium. You can you can see. Yeah, you know, all all different. They have LPS D1, V4, P2. And uh, yeah. you can see I, like uh, I, th I think this would be not good. for this company. There's plenty of other light, light pollution filters. Right. But I, I think this would be a good se segue into uh, narrowband filters, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we um, drop back out of here? We'll, we'll catch back up and then we're going to come back to that, especially when we get to deep sky objects, uh, where we have some of the pictures to show with that. So thanks. Hang on. Let me go back to share screen here. Uh, and thank you, Victor. That was helpful. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. So, you know, kind of jumping back into the planets and the moon here, um, you know, these slides here will talk about different types of filters to use. Um, and you could actually um, uh, take pictures of the moon during the daytime. If you could see it, um, you could image it and you could view it and you could observe it. And it's kind of interesting doing some daytime stuff, especially uh, when the moon is nice and close, depending on where it is in the, in the, uh, in this, in the yearly cycle. Um, but here's some ideas with the, you know, from the article that Jim was talking about that talk about different filters to use uh, in imaging the moon that way. Here's uh, the um, St. Patrick's Day moon. I bet you guys didn't know that there is a, a St. Patrick's Day moon, which is uh, Jim Johnson, who couldn't join us tonight. But Jim uh, did capture this uh, in time for us to have this meeting tonight. So um, he's colored it green. But uh, <laughs> so, you know, looking at, you know, Venus, um, it's uh, very, very bright. And you could put the filters on there to bring out the detail of Venus and uh, knock down some of the brightness. And this, you know, once again, he, he didn't talk about the, you know, that was during the daytime stuff he's talking about there. But at nighttime, there's ways to do this. Anybody do any Venus observing where you're using filters that you want to? Describe. Anybody on the call? Jim, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful course, though. What's that? Jim? That wasn't me. I'm not sure. Oh. I think it was Joel. Don't worry about him. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, yeah. I mean, when I've done Venus observing, I usually use that. Uh, deep uh, violet, something to really knock down the brilliance or else you're, you're just not going to pick up anything. Yes. Okay. And Mars though, um, there's different Mars filters that are, they're marketed as Mars filters. Uh, here's a kind of see the uh, picture near the orange one. Um, and the street. The, so Sally, you, uh, you keep going in and out of mute there. I'm going to mute you here. And if you have a question, just unmute me or something you'd like to contribute, just jump right in. And um, So the um, Mars has a lot of features that change all of the time. And Mars is an orange planet, has orange uh, uh, soil. And um, so an orange filter brings out a lot of different details and there's different levels um, for the Mars filter. I wanna show you a, a couple of examples. This is not a picture that was captured with a camera. This is a sketch that uh, Richard Orr has done. Richard is not on the call today, I don't think. But, um, and Richard used, and you could see right down here, he used the, the Mars B filter and a blue number 80, if you remember that list that I was showing you before, and then the green number 58 and a red 25. And he did this all visually. Um, I don't know how- I do want to point out, he did not use all those filters simultaneously. No, correct. Good point. Thank you very much. He didn't stack them together. No, he did them one at a time. And with each one of those filters, he captured different detail that he sketched with his with his sketch pad and his pencils. And um, and he took all that imaging over quite a bit of time. He didn't say on here how long he actually. Oh, there he is. 
23, he did for 45 minutes, it looks like. Uh, oh no, more than that. Uh, about, an, about that, right? Yeah, but anyways, so just after uh, midnight. An hour and a half. Hour and a half. Hour yes. and a half. Thank you for uh, doing the math. So, um, and then as a result of that, he ended up sketching this picture of Mars. So by having these different filters, he was able to see different details and then come up with this beautiful uh, image. So the method to his madness there is that the blue is going to bring out clouds or the polar caps because the blue is going to turn pretty much the whole rest of the surface dark. So it increases the contrast. Uh, the green I've heard can help with like fog or stuff, again, kind of clouds. And the red is definitely a big help for locating the albedo features that helps to really make them stand out. So he's kind of like, you know, taking observations of each one and then kind of from an artist standpoint, kind of taking the best out of each and giving you the final product there. Thanks, Jim. And then Jupiter, once again, you can, you know, you can pick these details up, uh, you know, off the, off our website um, and um, from the, from the presentation and talking about the different filters that this um, author of the article used and commented on. But here's uh, another sketch of Richards. Um, and here you could see that he used the green number 58 and the blue number 80 to Wayne's point, not at the same time. Um, and in order to capture these details on Jupiter, which he sketched. You know, one of the reasons I put these two pictures up kind of early on is I wanted to emphasize to everybody, you don't have to be um, uh, a photographer, uh, astro imager with cameras in order to benefit from filters and the joy of observing. And uh, you could argue, you know, sketchers are probably the best observers out there because they spend so much time just staring at a singular object or set of objects to capture all the detail. And for those of you who spend time in an eyepiece, you know just how difficult it is. You know, you look way one second, you look back, something's there or it's not. Um, uh, Steve Jaworski and I experienced that quite a bit recently up in West Virginia when you're searching for very faint galaxies. Um, but also, you know, even when you're processing an image, you do all this work so you can bring out all this detail and uh, filters help. If I may. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I have some uh, I, uh, something to screen share when you're done oh, talking about. Go Jupiter. ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll oh. stop and you can jump in. Oh, OK. Um, then we're going yeah. to the picture after that. Go ahead. So um, the, the gas giants um, bring in a, an additional um, uh, dimension when it comes to visual observing and that uh, they're made up of a lot of different types of gases, as you can imagine. Um, and, and so these gases give off light in different wavelengths. And so you can use um, filters that are outside the visual range to, um, to, to bring some of these forward. So this is the website of Christopher Goh. He's a pretty well in the, in the, in the planetary imaging Seen. He's a pretty uh, renowned, uh, you know, imager of Jupiter. He loves Jupiter. It's all, almost all, everything he images is Jupiter. Um, uh, and so every year he he pops up and 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 posts some magnificent photos of Jupiter that he's taken from the, his house in the Philippines. But here um, we see him using uh, three different types of filters, actually. So in the upper right hand corner here um, is Jupiter and you know, your typical kind of visual look at Jupiter. Um, you see the different colored bands, uh, the barges they call them, these ovoid shapes um, and other features. There's a great red spot right there on the, uh, in the, about the four o'clock position. But then um, that's visual. So, but if you if you go over to these two um, ima uh, two images on the uh, left hand side here, the one on top of each other, this one is uh, infrared. So this is this is at some uh, infrared wavelength. He doesn't specify here, but you're you're looking at the a near infrared image of Jupiter, and you can see um, some slightly different details and such if you if you look closely. The the one problem with infrared. And, and longer wavelength um, imaging is um, is that the Earth's atmosphere is full of water, and water is a fantastic absorber 
of infrared light. So it's not as clear as uh, the details aren't as clear as what you get on the visual side of things, uh, but they're there. Um, and below the infrared is an even narrower uh, chunk of the wavelength deep uh, into the near infrared around uh, 890 nanometers is CH4, that's methane. And so if you just wanna look at where all the methane gas is on, on Jupiter, there you go. Um, so uh, you see the, the great red spot is, is full of methane gas. These equatorial band is full of methane gas. These barges right here, these white spots, um, relatively full of methane gas. So you, you can see the distribution of different types of gases now by looking at these different types of wavelengths. And so all made possible by a, an array of different filters that are designed to cut out large chunks of wavelength and just let a, 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 a a certain bit through, or the opposite, cut out of, of some narrow bits and let the rest through. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out. Right. And also, also that has some scientific value in the methane view, because the things that are whiter are tending to be higher up in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So you also get a little bit uh, of information in terms of the, the height of the, uh, of the feature that you're looking at. So the great red spot and BA, which is a long uh, enduring oval at about the eight o'clock position there. And then those little string of cyclones that you see below the red spot, uh, all of those are lying up higher in the atmosphere as are, you can kind of see the, the polar hoods there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, I want to jump in with a couple of things quickly. Following right up on what Jim's saying, even in the visible light images on the right, Generally speaking, the darker the feature is, the deeper into the atmosphere of Jupiter you're seeing. So those dark brown barges, those bluish gray areas are deeper into the atmosphere than the white areas. The second thing I wanted to say is, is that Dale talked about the water vapor and the infrared uh, absorbing light. So it's not so much that it makes it cloudy, it just makes it like there's a filter in place, a neutral density filter over that small wavelength range. So it dims Jupiter at those wavelengths because, and it doesn't really affect your ability to see detail because actually as you go into the red and infrared, the atmosphere gets actually steadier than it does in the, the green and blue parts of the uh, spectrum. So you can actually get, uh, see the detail more steadily. Unfortunately, as you go to those larger, longer wavelengths, the resolution of your telescope gets smaller. So you, you can't yep. see the details as clearly. So they've got a whole bunch of competing factors that you're having to deal with to get good Im images at whatever wavelength you're working at. Cool. That's, that's, uh, so uh, just search for Christopher Go. it's G-O, uh, Jupiter, if you want to see the rest of his websites. And fantastic. Uh, Jupiter imagery, uh, and now and then a little bit of Saturn. Um, that's all, Phil. That's all I need. Um, okay, that's great. Way. That's great. So, um, just a little commercial here um, that everybody's been talking about wavelengths and um, absorption lines and the different um, elements that make up the planets, the deep sky objects. And there's a wonderful book out there that is very easy to understand. Um, it's called Light, and it's the visible spectrum and beyond. Uh, you can look this up. I use it all the time. It's got a very uh, excellent uh, um, examples uh, of light at different wavelengths and what it all means. And uh, I, I highly recommend this book. Uh, Michelle, uh, and for any educators, this book, if you don't already have it, is, uh, is a great one to use uh, with students. And if you just need a quick reference, it's also uh, excellent. I know Joel, I believe, also uh, uh, has a copy of that and uses it. Uh, yes, I do. Too. So I, I highly recommend that. Let me go back to the share screen here real quick. And uh, Jim, here's your... Uh, picture of Jupiter. Uh, I pulled this one from uh, October of last year. 
And uh, because I, uh, it was a great example, and I saw you know you're using a cut filter, IR cut filters. Anything you want to say about this? Yeah, that's uh, an important thing to have on your uh, scope. I'm using. I'm. I'm not doing. By the way, you can do planetary in in kind of one or two ways. You can do it taking red, green, and blue. So in other words, you use the monochrome camera, and you get a red image, a blue image, a green image, and then you have to combine it. It's it's challenging in that you then, for an object like Jupiter, you have to actually, the planet has rotated while you're taking each set. So you have to kind of like derotate before you can stack the three and get your final product, um, which is what James Willingham does. I know a lot of you guys have seen his work, which is just uh, really outstanding. Um, so I, I, I'm lazy. I use a simple color camera. Uh, but I do use a filter that cuts off ultraviolet and infrared because you actually will get some smearing. Uh, your camera is going to be a lot more sensitive to the infrared light. Uh, you may not see it with your eye, but the camera will. So it's just with planetary, it always seems to be that you're looking for whatever little tiny edge that you can take, whatever tiny little advantage. And so a uh, IR cut filter uh, or UV IR cut is going to definitely help give you a little bit so that you're not getting the smearing from uh, uh, that you would see with that. Yeah. And that smearing comes from the fact that um, you're focusing at a specific wavelength or uh, a, a, a band of wavelength. You're focusing on that and infrared light lies way outside that. And with refractive optics, and specifically, those refractive optics are, are, are figured such that they correct most in the visual spectrum, you know, the spectrum that you would see with your eyes. They're not correct. So if they're in focus for that, they're not going to be in focus for the infrared. And that's where that smearing that Jim refers to, because simply the infrared portion that's coming through is just out of focus. And so that's why you have UVIR cut filters, um, also known as luminance filters in the in the in the, in the monochrome imaging world, um, uh, uh, fitted in front of your your, your color cameras. Right. Just another little tag in there is that you also are getting a little bit of smearing with the blue, red, and green visually. Not a lot that you're going to be noticeable, but the really pro guys like Christopher Go or um, Clyde and his foster out of uh, South Africa, the, those guys will use a um, ADC, atmospheric dispersion corrector, which basically is like a little prism that kind of re uh, brings, it kind of brings those three images back together and centers them. Uh, so that's another trick, but that's nothing to do with filters. No. Now, one thing that's true in both the uh, uh, observational, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's observing with an eyepiece as well as imaging is when you're doing these planets that are far away, unlike the moon, um, you're generally pushing the power up to in, in order to increase the image size. And that alone causes all kinds of things that impact your view, whether you're looking, you know, um, in my five inch refractor, which has a 1000 and 70 uh, millimeter focal length uh, without an eyepiece, um, you know, you could look at something under low power and you know, like Jupiter, you can say, boy, that image is beautiful. Look how sharp that is. I could see the bands. But when you want to get in closer, you start picking up, you know, all the atmospheric movement. You start, you know, having focus, you know, issues, things are wobbling, all kinds of things are happening. And this is, you know, a contributor to all of these things that, you know, some filters will help bring out these things because you're the bigger you try and push it inside our atmosphere, um, you pick up all kinds of stuff. Did I say that right, Jim? Or Dale? You know, hey, Phil, you yeah. said it wrong, but just to be clear, you're saying power, you mean magnification. Magnification, right, yes. Thank you. And, 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 you're, and uh, you're basically, go ahead, Victor. No, no, please, go ahead. I was just going to say you're basically magnifying a lot of the turbulence. So it's like, you know, you're getting a larger image, but you're also getting all the extra turbulence in with it. Hey, Phil, you've got in the chat here, people want to know what the author of that book was that you mentioned. Do you have okay. that? Yep. It is. Um, well, it comes from a Kimberly 
our canned A as an apple, R, C as in Charlie, A, and D as in David. Okay, so it's Kimberly Arcand and Megan, M-E-G-A-N, Watsky, W, A, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra, K, E as in Edward. That's the, um, that's the uh, author, authors. So once again, um, here's some information on Saturn from uh, the information uh, that uh, Jim provided. And here's an example, uh, um, you guys who do this uh, regularly, uh, Jim Johnson, um, is, this was a great example I lifted um, from something he did uh, last year and where he shows using a red filter, a green filter, a blue filter, and then putting them all together. Um, and he also used a luminance filter, it looks like at the combination there. Um, uh, Dale or uh, Jim or somebody want to comment on uh, what, what's happening here? Or not? Um, well, I think it's interesting. You, you almost always have the blue being the, the rougher image out of the three. Uh, the red tends to be the little bit sharper. And even when you go into the infrared, you can sometimes get even sharper. Um, That's because of there, the wavelength dependence on seeing. It's worse in the blue yeah. than it is in the red. Yeah. Which is why sometimes when you have bad seeing, a nice red filter is good to have, uh, can kind of give you the best view, uh, making the best of a bad situation. And I want to point out a tip for those of you who have to collimate in doing the star test. Use a red use a red star because they usually will have a slightly steadier image than a blue star. Yeah. And and for those of you who are new to this, and you, you know, like uh, you know, what what is seeing? <laughs> um, seeing is kind of like a an amorphous term, I think. Um, but what it what it what it is a it's a and it's often subjective in in what it measures. But what it refers to is the how the turbulence in the atmosphere, the convection currents in the air, the mixing caused by winds of different densities of air masses above you and, and your line of sight between you and you know the, the object um, bends and refracts light. And you know a night of bad seeing is when it's really choppy up there and there's different uh, you know air masses quickly uh, you know, bouncing the wavelengths of light around as they as they come through the atmosphere to your eye. Um, nights of good seeing is when that's stable. You might think of a hot summer night as a good stable night when the air is thick and, you, and it feels like it's sitting on top of you. But bad seeing might be a, a cold winter day in the mountains when you've got winds and stuff and heat coming off the mountains and uh, interacting with cold air and um, you know, causing a lot of mixing that would cause that wavelength of those th that light to uh, jump around a lot. Now, different wavelengths of light are more affected or and less affected by seeing. Blue is a higher wavelength of light, and so the the high frequency effects of seeing bounce it around more, basically. <laughs> um, whereas the longer wavelengths, red, um, you know, more towards the red spectrum you know, to, to, to just, just to put it in a, in a non-scientific term, tends to cut through the seeing better. It's less affected by the high frequency effects of seeing. And so that's why in this image here is a perfect example of it, where the blue image is all blurry. You don't really see any kind of, you, you see general band separation. The Cassini divide is, is only just discernible. Um, but then you move to green, which is a slightly longer wavelength. And, some more details come out. The, the Cassini divide is readily apparent. Um, the major bands are readily apparent. Then you move to the red, the longest visual wavelength. And you know you start seeing bands within bands and the Cassini divide is apparent you know, all the way around the rings there. Um, and so uh, that's a, this is a prime example here of, of how seeing affects light. It's not that this telescope was out of focus for blue and in focus for red um, or anything like that. It's it's literally the effects of seeing that you see, that you have there. Right. And this is a great uh, picture that uh, Jim put together for, you know, talking about, you know, observing and imaging because, you know, it gives you an example for what you're looking at. The only thing you don't see here is 
uh, an image that wasn't using any filter, uh, where it's just straight through. And with Saturn, um, you know, it's going to be it's a it's it's another bright object, and you're not going to get see the details just with the straight white light view and by putting the colors in there. But once again, if you pick the wrong color for visual, it's going to look like your blue, red, green example here. And then for those of you who don't really know what we're talking about, we're, you could you could assume by combining we mean put all these together, which is exactly what's happening to come up with this this beautiful image in the bottom right corner. Um, we're not going to talk about the methodology in this meeting tonight and how to do that. That'll be another meeting sometime when we talk about post processing and stuff like that. But you need tools to do that, and there's skills you develop over time and how to do and how to do those things. But um, that's what happens when you put it all together. Uh, question. Yeah. So, in case you are doing some type of photometric calculation of the planets, um, let's say measuring its brightness over a period of time, how would you be able to calculate the atmosphere effects over the planet at that time? That's way beyond the uh, topic we're talking about, Arjun. <laughs> okay. Basically, basically, you have to compare. You have to observe some stars also at the essentially the same time, the same night, and you have to correct for the atmosphere. There are ways to do it, but it's far too involved to get into right now. Sure, I'll. I'll I've seen great like, question. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I've seen um people. Um, subtracting gradients from the RGB picture in order to avoid light pollution stuff. So I was wondering if you could mimic the atmosphere on that picture over that time, then you might be able to get some type of good results. There, there, there are there are there are effects uh, you could do uh, deconvolution effects and 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 stuff like that that um, kind of try to walk that the effects of seeing backwards. Um, but that's a that's a that's a whole image processing topic that's um, a world into itself. It's a good question, um, and it, it it you know like as Wayne said it it you know to to actually measure it you use some constant stars or forget what they're called but they're 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 known they're known constants your control group and then you standards yeah you know, standards, standards for comparison there you go yeah. Planet, and, and, planets are hard with comparison stars. You think of comparison stars usually with variable stars, but since planets yeah. move through the sky, your comparison stars would always be changing. So yeah, just, you, you have to observe some standards yeah. and you have to correct for atmospheric extinction and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. So the author, thanks, Arjun. Great question. So, and you know, one of the last things in this from this author here is um, he has a comet filter in there. So I went searching through the comet, the comet images that we've had in hell that I could find. And I didn't really see anybody that was using a comet filter. Does anybody had experience in utilization of a comet filter? I've never used yeah, one myself. Actually, like, go ahead, Jim. Actually, that's not the author, that's me. Um, okay, there, okay. I just wanted to point out that there is a swan band filter. I have one, and I've used it for comets in the past. They can help, especially if it is, you know, emitting that wonderful little green glow because that's your diatomic carbon and uh, your cyanogen. So it, it, it won't help with all comets because some comets are more reflected dust, you know, just like a light pollution filter isn't going to work on all nebulae. It's going to work mainly on an emission one. So if you've got a comet that's like emitting a lot in these uh, parts of the band, going back to like Victor's, uh, demonstration where you have a certain cut and you're letting through just certain light, they can definitely increase the contrast and make the uh, ion part of the comet uh, stand out a little bit better. Okay. Uh, I don't know that they're worth the price, you know, and considering how infrequently you have comets, but if you're a big comet guy, it might be something worth looking into. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. There you go. That's the rest of that. So, you know, and here's some uh, ideas of what some of these filters cost. And uh, they vary um, by the, the manufacturer, mostly. Um, and then there's a, there are quality differences, not 
every, you know, we didn't talk about oxygen three filters, I don't believe at all so far, and we probably should right now, but, uh, you know, not every oxygen three filter is the same. And there are definitely ones that um, you don't want to have. And there's ones that work very, very well. And I have an older oxygen three filter, which I don't use at all anymore because the image is very dark and the newer ones are much better. But maybe Dale, maybe you could just take a second and explain what the uh, benefit of an oxygen three filter or as we call it, O3 filter is. O3, yeah. So that's doubly ionized oxygen. Um, and um, so I, I, I want to back up a little bit and, and, and say that filters are generally there's generally three classes of filters out there, whether it's for visual or for uh, you know, imaging. And, and the three classes of filters are um, broadband, which would be an entire color or uh, multiple full colors across the spectrum, like a big chunk of the spectrum. There's no, you know, uh, uh, th those are called broadband filters. And so your red, your green, your blue filters, your UVIR cut, which to the, to the naked eye looks almost clear, you know, those are broadband filters. The, the, the second type of filter you can run into are, are, are narrow band filters, broad versus narrow. Um, narrow band filters, as you might infer from the name, um, are for blocking out large swaths of, of spectrum and letting a little teeny tiny slice through. And, um, and so a narrow band filter, uh, the oxygen three filter that we're referring to here, it would be an example of that. Another one would be hydrogen alpha filter or sulfur two, um, methane is a narrow band filter. Um, uh, and then there's multi-band filters and multi-band filters are kind of a more recent phenomena, I think, especially in the imaging world um, where they let, um, they, they, block, they still block out large swaths of, 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 of the spectrum, but they let little windows of certain wavelengths through. So um, popular in color cameras are, are you know, double and tri-band filters where you have one filter that blocks out everything, but lets through oxygen three, hydrogen alpha, or some other combination of wavelengths. So those are the three types of filters. So narrow band filters is what an oxygen three filter is. And O3, as we refer to it, is um, kind of occupies the teal air, uh, section of the, of the spectrum. I, I can't remember the general wavelength offhand. It's, there's actually it's comprised of two very close together uh, spikes in the spectrum, um, but it's- 5007 angstroms, 5007. Right, right. And, um, uh, and so the, um, uh, you know, different, different, um, different. So if you're, if you're wondering what, like what is oxygen three or what is this hydrogen alpha that I, I keep um, hearing about, um, a short, a short exp explainer of it is you're looking at a, a, a nebula and that nebula has very, a very powerful shock wave going through it or a very powerful uh, star in the middle of it or a group of stars or something, something that's giving off a lot of energy. And, um, and, and what happens is that um, that energy, there's, there's all this gas floating around and that energy um, strips or knocks a, an electron or number of electrons off the, the atomic molecules of that gas. In other words, it ionizes that gas. And so that energy, that energy is so great that it does that. Like a billiard ball, it just, it just picks it off like that. And, um, and what happens is that the, the electron will eventually recombine with the, with the, with the ion, ionized atom. And uh, when it when it comes when it comes back together, that that electron has a higher energy. It's full of full of energy. It just took a it just took a big knock from an ultraviolet you know star or something like that. So it's full of energy. It comes back. It needs to lose energy for it get for it to get back down to the ground state uh, for the for the atom that it's that it's recombining with. And so, how does it get rid of that energy? Well, usually it gives it off in the form of a photon or a number of photons. And uh, these photons are emitted at a specific wavelength. And so uh, when, and this is the same property behind a fluorescent light, by the way. And so um, 
when when that when an electron descends back down to its ground state, it gives off a photon or a number of photons at a specific wavelength or multiple wavelengths, de depending. It's this is quantum physics territory there. Um, but we see that as the the light. And so uh, doubly ionized oxygen, when it goes back to the ground state, it gives off a teal ish color of light that's centered on a specific wavelength. Uh, Wayne just said it. Um, and, uh, and so these filters are designed to block everything out except that specific wavelength. And so you just see that. And, 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 the re and what you can do is then, um, you know, you can learn the molecular makeup of a nebula um, or a star or something like that by taking these filters that look at specific wavelengths and seeing the intensity of light that comes through. Um, and, and therefore you can measure or infer the, the makeup of an object. And, uh, and so that's what narrow band filters do. Um, and I hope that wasn't, you know, a, a eye glazing, uh, explanation, but, um, th that's why they're important too. Um, uh, and, and, and often as, as imagers, especially in, and, and also visual users use these, uh, uh, these these narrow band filters to enhance contrast on objects of a certain type. And so if you if you if you took your 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 visual telescope and you put a an O3 filter on the end of it and you pointed it at the great nebula in Orion, you would see uh, details that you would not be able to realize with just looking at it, you know, with all the light coming in, you would see some structure and details that you that that would would have been uh, 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 hidden or uh, you know overcome by the light from other things. Yeah, that's great. And I was thinking of that as you were saying with the Orion Nebula. Uh, it's a it's a perfect target. It's nice and big and bright, and you could do lots of things with filters to to see the differences there. So that was a very good explanation, Dal. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the sun. We just have a couple of things here for the sun, although, um, and then we're gonna get into the deep sky. I know it's pushing late, we're gonna run over, but as long as you wanna stay on, we'll keep on going. You know, you know, getting into deep sky objects after that. But with the sun, um, this picture was recently taken by Jim Johnson uh, of a recent grouping of sunspots. This was using a white light filter. Um, what that means is it's the sun as we see it, you're looking at the photosphere. Wayne uh, gave an introduction to the safety uh, a little while ago on this and every filter we've talked about up until this point is optional. You know, um, you could use them or not. With the sun, filters are mandatory, 100%. And you never point anything any kind of optics, any kind of magnification at the sun directly. It's not a good idea to look at the sun directly just by looking at it either. Um, by magnifying those uh, intense rays that are going back to your eye, um, um, the, you know we've had a, we've had a, a meetings where we talk about the eye and how the eye works and how it can be damaged. And, and basically, you know you're burning the back of your eye, with these, these harmful rays and you don't have nerves back there. So you don't feel yourself burning, but you're permanently damaging yourself all the way to potentially blindness. So um, this image here was taken with a white light filter. If you look at something like this, these are mine. Um, you could get these in different kinds of ways. This happens to be an extraordinarily high quality, um, very flat wavelength, uh, um, Carl Zeiss, filter that I had for 30 years. And um, you don't have to go to that level of extreme. Um, but what that filter does is it blocks out the harmful rays. It does very little to knock down the brightness. That's a different uh, subject. Um, but that will remove like 99% of the harmful rays. And it also disperses the heat. It, it keeps the heat from piling down your optical tube going uh, going through it. I just recently had a personal experience. I used to talk about somebody else's, but I had my telescope set out on my deck and I didn't cover it up during the daytime. And I had an orange cap over my diagonal 
piece at uh, the other end. So when the sun swung around during the day, and for that brief amount of time, it was going down the optical tube, it burned a perfect hole right through the plastic uh, eyepiece cap. And um, then, that, then that's what it will do. So you could get other filters, you could buy them. There's uh, several that are available. Here's another one. Um, this is actually for my Questar. Um, and um, it, it works exactly the same way. Um, here's one that I have made. Now this one, uh, you know, Dale can't uh, jump through and snatch it out of my hand and throw it away on the virtual, but this one's made from Mylar. And Mylar is perfectly safe as far as blocking the harmful ways. Uh, a lot of the, um, the, the handouts, those cardboard ones, you know, people give you for eclipses and stuff, they're made with some kind of Mylar or something similar. Mylar will block the harmful rays. However, you have to be extraordinarily careful. These are all the, this is the type of filter that you would use to get the image that you're seeing there of these beautiful sunspots and the granulation that you see on the photosphere of the sun in that picture. But with here, the first thing you need to do with a Mylar filter when you go outside is you need to hold it, not at the sun, just hold it up, you the bright. And if you see one pinhole, you throw it away. And you go back to, uh, you know, to um, one of the fabric stores or whatever and buy yourself another sheet or you can get astronomy quality Mylar that you can order online. But um, and you, you don't tape it, you don't try and patch it, you throw it away because it doesn't take anything. So these are examples of white light filters. Um, Phil, and there's also another one called a Herschel wedge. Phil, which is, go ahead. Phil, I'd yeah. like to recommend that if you have one of your high price glass solar filters, yeah. check it the same way because if you manage to pick up a scratch or something on it, you'd rather know it before you've got it on the end of your telescope. Right, that's by the way, so I, I keep, these filters, um, the uh, the big one I showed you is actually in a metal canister um, to protect it. And the Mylar one I keep in Tupperware that's very rigid. So nothing will come down and just bend it or puncture it. But uh, when we talk about the brightness on the back end of the telescope, I've got this very, it's almost black. And I actually have to double stack it with other um, neutral density filters to get some imaging in because the sun is so bright through a large aperture telescope. And um, there's a whole other methodology to, to, to shrink that down too. But um, this will not protect you in any way, shape or form from harmful rays. All this does is knock down the brightness. Um, so these are you know, the, the tools that you need for white light telescopes. And they don't have to cost a lot of money, in fact, some that are very actually reasonable, but you you absolutely have to have them. Um, Dale or anybody else that does uh, anything solar with white light, do you have anything you want to add to that for filters for white light? Uh, no, um, uh, no, you pretty much said it all. My my personal preference are, are solar wedges, um, but uh, you have to make sure that you're buying a quality solar wedge. Um, there are some cheap ones out there. This is a um, this is a, a, a topic where price has a direct correlation with safety, not so much quality, but safety. And, and so um, you generally want to pay uh, to make sure that you don't blast your eyes out. Yeah. So yeah, solar wedges, um, the old style used to send the heat right down and exit it out towards your lap and you could burn your leg with it if you were careful. They fixed that in the newer ones. But um, Dale's exactly right. A solar wedge, first, they're not inexpensive. You know, the, the Bader one is about 800 some dollars, maybe it's higher now. Um, and it gives you image quality of the granulation on the sun um, in, in detail that you, you won't get from a regular white light filter. I mean, it's just spectacular. But, um, and also all the light, all the energy from the sun is traveling down the tube there's no filters at all um, until you get back down to the wedge. And so depending on the size of your telescope, you, you may need to put a, um, a heat reflecting filter off the front of that to keep all that heat from not barreling down the tube. Um, so yeah. the large ones, you, 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 you can get those, you can buy them. They're not that expensive. 
And you'll, you'll generally see them, they're, they're red and they're, they look like red glass. They're, they're referred to as ERS or energy rejection filters. Yeah. So then there's hydrogen alpha. Um, hydrogen alpha is, um, uh, here's a picture that I recently took. And this with the hydrogen alpha filter, um, you are looking at the uh, chromosphere of the sun as opposed to the photosphere, which is with the white light. And this will allow you to see the prominences, the filaments and other types of features on there. Um, I use a, um, uh, I have a, a filter, a telescope that was built with the filters in it, an H alpha telescope. And that's uh, hydrogen alpha. We can talk about bandpass and um, it's at 656 nanometers uh, is the bandwidth for, uh, and plus some decimal points for, for H alpha. And there's different methodologies for doing that. You could have a telescope that's built with the H alpha in there, or you could have other devices like a, a quark, which goes into an eyepiece. And I think Dale's got another one. He's um, from uh, one of the other companies, Daystar probably. Yeah, like. so, so here's, a, here's an example of one of the quark ones. This is, uh, this is for hydrogen alpha. I've got ones for uh, calcium K line, which is another solar bandwidth and the magnesium B2. But hydrogen alpha is the, 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 the popular one. This is, a, this is designed to be a drop-in um, called an eyepiece um, uh, 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 solar filter. This one actually has, uh, from this part back, this is a camera. So you can ignore this part here and, and just pay attention to this part up here. And so um, uh, this, this drops in uh, to your diagonal uh, like, a, like any kind of normal eyepiece. Um, but there's a, there's a few things, and then you put your eyepiece into the end here, or in this case, I have a camera uh, attached to it. Um, but the, the filter in here is, is what is doing all the, 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 the blocking and moderation of the sun's light. Um, at the front end of this, I have a UV IR cut filter, a regular UV IR cut filter. And because it's a UVIR cut filter, a lot of the heat energy is bounced back out the front of the telescope um, before it reaches the inside of this filter. Um, and this is a different design. Uh, this is, uh, the filter material here is, uh, is muscovite mica. A very, very, very thinly sliced muscovite mica. And uh, the tuning of it is done via heat. And so there's actually a little thermal, uh, little oven inside this eyepiece here that's governed by this knob, powered by this USB port. And the eyepiece will heat up that piece of uh, muscovite mica to make it what's called on band. In other words, it's filtering and letting through the hydrogen alpha uh, uh, wavelength that you wanna look at. And thus that gets through to your camera or through your eyepiece. Um, so this is less a, a, a indication of the complexity of solar narrowband filters. You can't just go out and buy a cheap hydrogen alpha filter that you would use for imaging. You cannot do that. Um, don't, don't think that you can just take that filter and put it in your telescope and say, I'm going to go look at the sun now. Don't do that. You'll, you'll, you'll first ruin your eyes and, all, and also ruin your filter. Um, uh, hydrogen alpha filters and, and narrowband filters for solar viewing are special devices, and so um, uh, so so please don't 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 try that. You know, I'd like to emphasize on that yeah. because I'm glad you brought it up. Is that there are hydrogen alpha filters like we were talking about for looking at other things. That's not that's for that. It's for, it's right not for solar. <laughs> right. Yeah, so don't don't think you're being clever and 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 uh, and 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 getting off cheap by using one of those. It's it's, it's very dangerous to do. Right. Uh, but this is an example of the of the IP style um, type of filter that gives you images like that. Yeah. So that's kind of the conclusion of the the solar part. I mean, there's we could do entire sessions on this and the benefits. Um, of using different types of filters in H alpha, but there are different ones like the quark and everything else. And I'd love to have that conversation offline or in an astro school or something with others. But uh, for today, that gives you the idea. And Dale mentioned calcium K line. Um, if if you're not 
there's no there's no rookie solar person that's going to be using calcium K-line. Okay, it's a very specific thing. It gives a, you see other features. You see them on you know in in space weather. They'll show that sometimes or other places. But calcium K-line is only for imaging. You don't ever look through a calcium K-line filter with your eyes ever ever. So it's it's it's, it's, it's very dangerous. So if you ever hear that, if somebody says I got a calcium K-line filter, it's only for putting a camera on. All right. the, the, the reason being is because it's 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 just at the pre, uh, start of the ultraviolet range, and so um, if you're if you don't want cataracts, don't don't do it visually. Yeah. All right. So I know we're kind of at the our our end time, but uh, we haven't even scratched the uh, deep sky yet. So we do have some images here to go through. So I'm going to keep going as long as everybody wants to hang on. If you need to drop off, uh, thank you very much for joining. We're going to keep the recording going this time because there's a lot of information that'll be shared. So what I've done is I've taken the images that were submitted um, for this month. And um, so when um, you, the folks who, who are online who, um, um, who, do, who contributed these images could talk about what they did, did here and the filters that they used will, will stimulate this conversation. Um, so um, this one's Brad. Brad, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. So um, this is a two frame mosaic I've been working on for about two months because I'm sure everybody's having the same problem with a lot of cloud, not a lot of clear weather to try and finish this up and the earth's rotating and had to finish up. So this is shot in narrow band filters, both hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, um, and then combined into an RGB image. Um, what's really interesting to me about this, to divert from the filters for a second, is this is, is one field of view that shows the fate of the two possible end fates of stars. On the right is a planetary nebula, which is the end state for stars of less than eight to 10 solar masses. This is actually about, I believe this is the largest planetary nebula in the sky that we can see. The diameter of that for reference is about three times the diameter of the full moon. So the thing's huge, but very faint. And on the left side is a supernova remnant, um, which is, of course is the fate of a star greater than eight to 10 solar masses. So in, in this one, one image, you can see both of them. And it's actually fascinating that both about the same size. The supernova remnants, from what I was able to determine, is about 10 times further away. Um, but they end up being almost the same size, angular size, from our perspective. Um, so I don't know, uh, the filters, so they use, like I said, they use hydrogen alpha filter, which is mostly the red color you see. And then I use an oxygen three filter for the green and blue channels uh, to combine to get this. Cool. And this is a really this is a really good example of using narrowband filters to see the composition and the distribution of certain material in an object. Um, you know the O3, the oxygen three, oxygen gas is the the molecular oxygen gas is that teal color. Um, so you can see where the oxygen is in that in that object, and of course hydrogen uh, is is the red, and you can see, you can see oh. that there's very clear separations there. Yeah, one other point, which is interesting because there's a bunch of, I've been looking at planetary nebulas. You can find a, there's a, I think it's Williams College has spectra of all these different planetary nebulas. And so the red is actually, particularly in the planetary nebula, there's actually three, there's three um, emission lines there right within that hydrogen alpha filter. One is the hydrogen alpha. There's two nitrogen lines right there. And in, from what I've been seeing, most of the planetary nebulas, it's actually dominated by nitrogen rather than uh, hydrogen, which kind of makes sense because it's expelling all these, you know, carbon elements, nitrogen yeah. thing. So yeah, it's actually more nitrogen in that case. That's a great picture. And is not on, so we were going to talk about, uh, I was going to have Hannah talk about the filters she used. She actually took this picture and the next one, this is the Orion Nebula. Hey, Hannah's here. Yeah. Oh, Hannah, you are here. I am here. Oh, I called you out earlier, but you weren't around. Oh, no, I, I, I joined later on. Um, ah, but yeah. Good thing I this didn't think that right. about you. All right, uh, Hannah. Go uh, ahead. This is my Orion Nebula. I can't really remember how many... Uh, like 
what the total exposure time was for this, but I think it was only about like 20 minutes. I took this with the Illing scope at the Howard Astronomical League Observatory at Alpha Ridge. Um, many thanks to Wayne for helping me winterize and dewinterize uh, the observatory while I use the scope. Um, it was just very exciting to get something like this. I mean, I last tried to take a picture of the Orion Nebula last winter with my uh, use $75 telephoto lens on my um, Canon Rebel uh, crop sensor camera. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, it's fun to kind of see how things progress and how I begin to, um, you know, really kind of understand the whole processes that go behind imaging uh, things within our solar system and beyond them. So uh, that was really exciting. I love the detail icon, the Running Man Nebula. I'm also super proud that um, I didn't completely blow out the core of the Orion Nebula because it's such a dynamic image. So I was still able to get some, you know, more not quite the trapezium region, but some more detail closer to the core as well as some. Now, were you using, were you using a color camera or were you using filters on a monochrome camera? Color camera, yeah. So this was a color camera um, on the uh, Illig scope right now. Um, but yeah, so I was just very excited to, you know, you can't see the trapezium region, but still get that nebulosity close to um, M, yeah. uh, M43, as well as kind of the outskirts of the nebula as well. So right. very exciting. Awesome. And here's another one you took with the Illig scope also, right? Yes, um, this is M81. This is my favorite galaxy, also known as Bode's galaxy. Um, I don't really know why I have an affinity for it. I just really like grand design spiral uh, galaxies. And I think it's just at a really cool uh, angle. It's kind of situated at a cool angle compared to our point of view. Um, and I just decided to leave it inverted because I thought that brought out some extra fun detail, um, kind of an ode to you know, the Harvard computers and their work on glass plates and mapping, um, you know, stars and places beyond the solar system, as well as Edwin Hubble's famous plate that he used of the Andromeda galaxy to prove that the Milky Way isn't just our entire universe. But um, I always like kind of seeing what I can do uh, with, you know, these, you um, uh, celestial objects that have been imaged for close to 100 years and now seeing kind of like how I can make it my own. So yeah, it was very exciting. And like I said, this was also, this was I think about an hour's worth of exposures taken with the ILIG telescope as well. So colored camera too. Very nice, beautiful. Right. Phil, can I just put in a plug for hello here um, from what Hannah just did. Hannah has been a, a member for I don't know how many uh, years now, but if any, but he on this call has been a member of HAL for more than nine months, he is eligible to come and learn how to use the telescope, become a certified operator, and uh, do images like this. Right. Another so to, value member. Thank you. So to, to touch on that, um, we, we purposely held off on the training for people that want to become certified telescope operators until next month. Uh, Victor is working on putting together the program and it's getting very close to being launched and uh, he'll get in, and he'll communicate with the people who have already shown interest. And um, if you are interested in becoming a certified telescope operator to use the telescope in the observatory, um, you could drop me an email uh, offline or if you have Victor's email, I just send it to him and uh, we'll get you on the list. So thanks awesome. Joel very much. Whether or not you can be, I just want to butt in, whether or not you um, are, are aren't eligible, if I'm at like an impromptu and you're attending or if I'm at a public star party and um, I can, I'm can, i using the ILIG scope, anyone's always welcome to come in and like I love just talking and keeping company. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thanks, Hannah. Is there some type of age limit for the um, HAL observatory thing? Well, you're you're eleven point nine now, right? Or eleven point ten? Yes, oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Arjun, I believe it is eighteen. Eighteen. I will uh, double check. Yeah, no, you're correct, Joel. Yeah, but that's the so Arjun, you still there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, there you are. So the um, that is to become a certified telescope operator. Um, that's the age limit. But if you want to go in and work with somebody like Hannah or one of the other certified uh, CTOs, if 
when they're doing something, you could certainly, like any other member, go in there and sit down with them and you guys choose a target and get it. You could put your data on a, on a, um, on a flash drive, on a USB drive and take it home with you and process it. So it doesn't mean you can't use the telescope. It means just you can't use the telescope alone. Okay. okay. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you. And Arjun, so these last pictures for the night are from you. Um, I know you're using a remote telescope, which is awesome. Um, I'm going to start doing some of the same things. Uh, and um, do you know, um, was this using uh, filters uh, when you grabbed these images? Could you talk to each one of them? Or were we using a color camera? And how were you doing it? All right. So I was using an S-Big mono camera. Um, I used HA, O3, and S2 filters. Although for this image, I um, did the same amount of exposure for every filter and found that the um, S2 filter had barely any signal. So I just grabbed that away and then I um, processed that data by using selective color with the HA and O3 signal, which had some pretty good signal there. So that's what I did. Awesome. Pretty good. Dale or anybody else? Okay. That's great, Arjun. That's yeah. awesome. And then Arjun, what's this one? Okay, so this is the California Nebula. Um, so the stars were misaligned because I took this over two nights and the framing wasn't proper. So the stars were greatly misaligned. So it's either sacrificing the stars or sacrificing the alignment of the nebula. Um, so I just went for the stars. It doesn't look too bad, but as I go into the more artistic approach, um, it's trying to look really bad. So, no, it's yeah, all right gonna... because no, it's all part of the learning experience. And one one of the things that I, you know, not one, I mean, many of the things I love about what you do is that you know we're all learning by watching you learn. And you know, when people who are in these meetings and they see uh, the images from from Brad and 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 and. Um, um, J Jared and um, Hannah and everybody else that we can just go on and on about um, and Dale and everybody else that those, you know, those people have been doing this for a while and they know they had the processing techniques down, you know, so much is in the post-processing, but as you do these things and you, the thing is so cool with you, Arjun, is that you recognize where, why things are they, the way they are when you're looking at them, you know, it's not a mystery to you. And so, you know, you know, that's the biggest challenge. If you understand what you're looking at there, then you know how to correct it for the future. And as you're learning, the rest of us are learning too. And it also explains that, you know, taking a picture of a, a nebula or any other deep sky object is not as simple as pointing your iPhone up and snapping a shot, right? So that's the awesome what you're doing. And here's your last one for the night. And I think it's the last one for the night altogether. Okay, so uh, this is the flame nebula. If you so, if you zoom in really close onto the picture, you can see that there are tiny hot pixels, and that's because the telescope which I was working on um, had a, um, was not on operation for about three years, and so the calibration frames weren't properly corrected, so you get those um, tiny dots. But overall, from the um, wide field perspective it seems okay um you can see that there is some gradient from Alnatac attack on the top you can see the um the fraction spike over there um well overall this is um, just a normal flame nebula picture um i like the dust on the outer edges so yeah that's all i have awesome well um i think that's the end yes thank you very much uh, let me stop sharing the screen here. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, you know, this is a, you know, great when we have the opportunity to just interact with each other. Uh, if there's anybody that would like to cover a particular topic, you know, please just let me know. We try and if we can't do it at a, a monthly meeting like this, we could potentially run an astro school, which is kind of a, one of our impromptu type meetings. Uh, where we just cover a specific topic for an hour to an hour and a half. 
and uh, we'd bring in experts from our own group or if we have the opportunity and get somebody from outside the group, we could bring that people, that person or those people in also. But um, this concludes the, uh, the, the meeting for our, for our March 2022 HAL meeting. Uh, this Saturday night at Alpha Ridge is our members only star party. Once again, we'll have to see how the weather is doing. Uh, I want to thank our hosts. Phil, will be... Phil, you don't mean this Saturday night, do you? It's next Saturday. Is it next Saturday night? Oh, okay. We just have a full moon tonight, it, oh, or is it this Saturday? Ne I thought it was on the. Could somebody verify that on the website real quick, please, before we uh, yep. start the recording? Uh, members only, March 26th. Okay, next Saturday. So that's next Saturday. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, the weather's not looking that great for this Saturday, so um, good planning. Uh, well, very good. So thank you very much, everybody. I um, appreciate everybody you know, hanging in and um, for all the interactivity for Dale and Jared and Jim and, and others who helped me uh, prepare for tonight. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording now. So uh, if I... It, uh, if if uh, if I if I